Great. Well, uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, for this evening's um, Faces of the Fraser speaker event. Uh, my name is Michael Goodchild, uh, Museum Coordinator um, at the Fraser River Discovery Center. Uh, with me this evening are uh, Stephen Bruniel, our Director of External Relations and Development, uh, and Ricardo Coppola, uh, a museum assistant who will be assisting us with this evening's presentation um, with a bunch of live tweeting. Uh, on behalf of all of us, I'd like to thank you for uh, joining us uh, for this evening's event. Uh, but before we begin, uh, I would like to acknowledge that the Fraser River Discovery Center is located on the traditional and unceded territory of Coast Salish peoples. Now, ter territory acknowledgement is just one small part of reconciliation. So please take a moment to consider other ways that you can participate uh, in reconciliation with indigenous communities. Now, Faces of the Fraser, for those of you who don't know, provides an informal opportunity for our communities to engage with individuals and organizations uh, that live and work on the Fraser to learn more about the role that the river plays in our daily lives. And this month, we are very excited to welcome the fantastic uh, Fernando Lesser, uh, who will be presenting on his photography and documentary project, Urban Salmon, which focuses on the revival of Pacific salmon populations in the Metro Vancouver watershed. Best known for his conservation and ecology photography, uh, Mr. Lesser has documented wildlife all across British Columbia and the world, uh, and we're very lucky to have him back. So what tonight's presentation will work is that Fernando will give his presentation, uh, including time to watch the documentary itself, which is about 12 minutes long. Um, you'll be able to ask him questions after that. If you have any questions during the presentation, you can simply type them into the chat. And then at the end, uh, myself and uh, my coworkers will read through the questions from oldest to newest to make sure everyone's questions get answered. Um, to make this as smooth as possible though, we'd like to ask that you keep yourselves on mute for the duration of Fernando's presentation. Uh, as I mentioned, we'll also be live tweeting about this on our Twitter page. So be sure to head over there either during or after the discussion to keep the chat going. So without further ado, uh, welcome Fernando, welcome back. Hello everyone, uh, thanks so much for having me. Um, it's uh, it, I really like the, the work that the Fraser River Discovery Center does and uh, I'm very happy to be here again and share some uh, urban salmon stories. So let me uh, share here my presentation. <clears throat> <clears throat> Perfect. So um, today I would like to, to talk about the, the Urban Salmon Project uh, a little bit in a different way. Um, I've been here in the Face the Fraser uh, last year talking about the book. Uh, and but today we're going to focus a little bit more about the uh, documentary, which is uh, which just been released a couple of weeks ago. So for the ones that never heard about the project, the Urban Salmon is the first uh, photographic documentation of the salmonids in Vancouver. When I mean salmonids, uh, I mean all kinds of salmonids, not just salmon. So we get all the species of Pacific salmon in Metro Vancouver. But the, po the project also focuses uh, in uh, cutthroat trout, rainbow trout, um, um, bull trout, dolly vardens, and, and all other uh, salmonids that most people are not aware of. So, um, as I said, uh, this is the first time someone um, got in the camera like systematically. So, I started from a river to another and just kept going. Um, we're very lucky we are, when we are one of the very few cities in the world that still get a healthy uh, salmon population right in our backyard. And um, hope you, I'll get you guys surprised of the number of fish that we get in our backyard. So the project started um, with me walking in the road and seeing uh, those signs. So sometimes you have the white signs saying uh, say that there is or there was a salmon stream in Vancouver and depends where you are based. It could be this sign or you also get these signs. And when I first saw this yellow fish by the ranger ants, I got like super curious, like what does it mean? It's like, is there salmon in the road? Like is there salmon in water drains? Like what, what does it mean? 
So <clears throat> I started uh, doing a lot of research. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of uh, reliable information available, but spend a couple hours on Google and get my camera and, and start uh, visiting different locations. And I was just amazing uh, with what I found. So this is a, it's my secret map. Um, this shows um, all the spots I visit um, to produce the book and the documentary. So, so far in five years, I've been to 33 streams. I'm not sure if you're gonna get 33 uh, little hearts here. Uh, sometimes I have different uh, streams, they're, uh, they're very close to each other, but this kind of illustrate um, the most important uh, salmon areas in Metro Vancouver. So just here in the map, I'd like to highlight uh, the Fraser here, uh, here uh, in the lower part. And this is very special because this is the entrance, uh, the Fraser River and the estuary here, this is the entrance of most of the salmon in BC. Uh, I have to remember the Fraser River, uh, even though with very uh, low returning numbers, it's still the most important salmon river in, in BC and probably in Canada as well. So salmon that get in here, they're gonna uh, spread all around Metro Vancouver and, and some of them will keep their, uh, their journey and some salmon can swim up to thousand kilometers to reach their spawning ground. But here in Vancouver, um, the, sal the urban salmon, they had like a kind of short swim. So they get into the Fraser River and um, they go all around to kind of coast by New Westminster and Burnaby when most of them get to Burnett River and from Burnett River, they spread around uh, Burnaby Lake and then from the small tributaries in East Bend. We also get um, uh, really strong, like really good populations around uh, Surrey and, and Langley. I, I really like Pine High Hatchery. It's a, it's a place I always recommend if you wanna see someone and is a really nice hatchery in a park. So that's a place I like a lot. And also besides um, like the main core, like uh, East Vancouver and Burnaby, um, North Vancouver is a very special place uh, and also Coquitlam. So it give, looking here in the map, it gives an idea of the, the most important places and the most important rivers. And this is the kind of uh, images um, I've captured and the, the kind of like the number of returning fish. And uh, just um, deserves mention that uh, in this picture, uh, there's very few to almost no hatchery fish. These are, this was taken in the Simmer River. And if you see here, these are mostly um, wild fish, which is, uh, which is very important, especially nowadays that um, the returning numbers are just crashing. And, uh, and unfortunately, a big, part, a big chunk of our, our salmon, our hatchery fish. So um, I get a lot of questions. How did the book was made? How did the documentary was made? And you know, do I get in the water? Or do I don't get in the water? What camera I use and, and everything. So uh, the first thing I would like to highlight are the, the food practices. Of course, um, when the adult salmon is in our backyard, they're in the peak of their spawning time. So you have to be extremely careful uh, to limit the stress on fish. And also, so I, I really um, follow some kind of food practice. So I always play the welfare of my subject, the fish above uh, all else. And I must be especially careful, you know, not to stress the fish, not to uh, make them turn them into an easy prey, you know, like an, uh, I stress that someone could find uh, shelter in a place that's not really a good shelter and then can uh, become an easy prey for predators. So uh, I was very careful. I tried to use um, the least invasive um, techniques possible. So if there was a chance, I would get in the water with my camera. If there was less water, I would just get the camera. And if it was too shallow or the fish are uh, very stressed out, I use GoPros, uh, selfie, selfie pose and uh, whatever technique uh, that was available to, to capture the, the images. 
So I'd like to share the small video. This is from 2018. And um, this video, when this video was recorded, I was trying to get the very first Chan Salmon that was uh, swimming up uh, Stony Creek in Burnaby. So I really, really kept an eye on the forecast. And when I knew the first rain was coming, um, I was basically waiting the fish since um, 2 a.m. And this was recorder uh, recorder kind of around 5, 6 a.m. And why at night? Because um, salmon has uh, so many predators. So they try to move during night where they kind of more protected. And uh, that's where most of the salmon migration in freshwater happens. Um, if, uh, if there's a fisherman around, they know that um, especially coho, if you want to fish for them, you got to be very early in, in, uh, in the morning by the river. And once like the sunlight hits the water, the fish just hides and they become super difficult to catch. So sometimes you got to do it at night. So let me just um, play this short video. So um, not, it's just a short clip, not sure if you guys could pay attention at the beginning when I'm getting ready. So I use a wetsuit uh, for 99% of the time, a very thick one, seven millimeter, which is a little bit thicker than the surfers you use. And just uh, also another detail, when I'm getting ready, see there is a bear uh, spray can. And this film was captured just a couple of minutes of me uh, seeing my first bear, which was riding uh, in Burnaby, sorry, in Stony Creek in Burnaby. And the salmon was doing exactly what I was doing. Uh, they're, uh, we're both there waiting for fish in a shallow area where they, uh, are, uh, when they are like an easy prey. And uh, also in the end of the video, you see I'm filming the chan and then it comes towards me. So especially male and especially chum, they're very, they're, they're very territorialist. And this guy actually tried to, not to bite, but kind of move me out of his territory. And uh, he kind of hits my, my, my house and then I got a really nice scratch. And some ones, they, they tend, even the small ones, they really tend to keep their territory and they don't really like, like they make clear when you get too close and so the good side of it is sometimes you get in the water all the fish move away but you know if you stay there calmly and you know just wait the fish will eventually come back to very much the same spot and uh, you can uh, record and sometimes in the case of adults uh, if they not comfortable be around there they make it uh, very clear so they can hear you the, the, the camera. Sometimes they try to bite you and make clear like you're not welcome. And when that happens, I just, I just move away and um, go for a different spot. So um, it's, it's very important to be careful with fish. So the biggest thing is uh, Vancouver, I, I believe most people were, uh, was, like in a salmon heaven, there was thousands and thousands of fish. We're talking about a hundred million um, fish swimming uh, the Fraser River uh, every year. And some of those would stay in Vancouver. And unfortunately nowadays we are around 1% of those historical numbers. And what exactly happened with the fish, right? Why there's so few fish in Vancouver right now? So this is uh, one of the topics that unfortunately we could not have uh, in the film. So this is an old map of the city of Westminster of, uh, from 1860. And if you look here, all these are canneries. So 
the Fraser River, where most of the BC salmon will have to go through, they'll have to pass through all the scanneries. And these guys were fishing around 28 million uh, salmon at the peak, which was around 1900. So imagine that all the fish that will go through the Fraser River, 28% would stay, would stay here and not go any further. So from the 73% that could make all this, they, would, they could keep going and maybe be fishing some other spots. But the, from someone in Vancouver, they would have to deal with another issue, which was, uh, if you see here, this brunette sawmill. So brunette sawmill was the biggest uh, sawmill in the British Empire. And it totally changed the river, uh, the Brunette River mouth, which was the only entrance for salmon to East Vancouver. So there was not just uh, the forest that was put down, all the, the shape of the river was changed. Uh, we started getting all the sawdust throwing in the river. And when you're talking about the biggest uh, salmon empire, you can imagine the amount of the sawdust that would be thrown in the water, totally affecting and changing all the environment. And so from the fish, they could pass that. They would keep going to Brunan River and going to Burnaby Lake. But then again, there were logging camps and dams and so many small issues affecting the salmon. So even before any uh, urban development really started, uh, salmon already had to deal with like total uh, transformation of their environment. So if you consider all those issues plus the fishing plus the development plus pollution and all those issues. So that's uh, what happened with the salmon in Vancouver. And that's why uh, our returning numbers are so low compared to historical numbers. But again, uh, we still get a, a healthy and uh, population in Vancouver, even with all those issues uh, in the past. So when you talk about urban development, this is a map, uh, it's called the Lost Streams of Vancouver. And if you see all this uh, red, all the rivers that are marked in red, these are rivers that are not available for fish anymore. Either they've been cut, there was construction on top of it. So uh, these are, we, we, you know, we say like they're not highlighted so the sunlight cannot hit them and fish will never get in a, in a river that, uh, you can't see the other way, right? It, you can't see the, high, the, the sunlight getting in, so fish uh, won't access those rivers. And if you see most of the rivers were, uh, they're not available, they're not fish habitat anymore. And um, if you look here in Burnaby and Steel Creek, these are all the small streams that, that uh, would spread salmon in, in East Vancouver and they're not available to fish anymore. So that's after all that, we have all these streams that were lost, and that's why uh, salmon numbers are, are very low nowadays. So, uh, as I said, the project uh, was, uh, it was definitely focused in a Pacific salmon, but we are also looking for some other rare species. Some that I was aware they were around and some that I have no clue at all. So I would like to uh, bring up some, some species for you guys. So uh, this is the Nooksack dace. This is a very, very important fish um, for us. And we're very uh, lucky to have them around here. So the Nooksack, they're like, they're uh, cousins from carp. So they're very small fish around six inches. And most of the people don't really know, like they don't give importance to this fish, but they're very, very important. Um, there's estimated there's less than 10,000 of this fish in the whole world, divided in a couple of small populations. And we're lucky to have two of those populations here in Burnaby, sorry, one in Burnaby and one in Surrey, Surrey Langley. Uh, the, yeah, I guess it's, Lang it's Surrey. So what happened with this fish is during the glaciation, those small populations got isolated. So the glaciers melted and uh, those small populations got isolated and they're not connected to each other. So they, become, they can only be found in small places. Uh, we, have a, we have a healthy population uh, in the Brunette River and that's where this picture was, uh, was taken. 
And right now, the Brunette River is uh, the Brunette River and the Nooksack Days are becoming uh, a symbol for the urban streams because since they're so rare in danger, I know any alteration, modification, or any construction by the river um, has the chance to really affect those guys. So any development, any big project uh, built around the river, they must be very, very well uh, considered and analyzed. Uh, in case they affect uh, these guys. Another, uh, I'm sorry, and that's a blue listed fish. Uh, and here uh, we have the endangered steelhead. Uh, steelhead uh, different uh, from the Pacific salmon. They have the ability to spawn more than once. So some adults, they can get in fresh water, spawn, spend some time, uh, return to the ocean, build up energy again, and next year they come back and spawn again. And there's still had that are known for spawning three, four times. Um, not sure if you guys are aware, all the Pacific salmon, they die after spawning, but they still had doesn't most of the time. So that was uh, why uh, some First Nation um, called them the ghost salmon, because they will never die. And some groups even got to a point of not fishing those at all and not predating just because, you know, they're the ghost fish, they should not be touching. And uh, we're very lucky, we still get some steelhead in our urban environment. They're very, they're targeted by sport fishing and commercial fishing as a bycatch. And unfortunately, the numbers in the Fraser River and the tributaries are crashing. Um, there's a there's fight from environmentalists trying to get this fish uh, listed as and the, as, as added to the blue list of endangered animals. But uh, unfortunately, that's uh, an ongoing um, situation, and you know they're becoming more rare. Um, the first time I saw them in the urban environment was in North Vancouver in Lynn Creek. And I was very lucky to have them returning. Uh, most of the run now is in the winter. So to have them in the winter of 2016, 2018, but unfortunately in 2019, 20 and 21, I haven't seen uh, still had in Lynn Creek. Um, I heard some, some resources mentioned uh, there's people targeting those fish in, uh, in, in, in our urban watershed. Some of the rivers still allow that, uh, some don't. But um, you have always to remember there's so few of this fish, they're so rare. And um, so we have to be very careful. Uh, this one was photographed in the Capilano River, which is still get uh, a couple fish, a couple still had returning uh, every year. So we have, we're so lucky to still have them and, but we get to be very, you gotta be very careful. Just to give an idea of how rare this fishing are becoming. Um, recently, I finished a project uh, in the Northwest coast of Vancouver Island in Gold River. And the Gold River was known as one of the best uh, fishing, uh, one of the best rivers for fishing still had in the whole world. And unfortunately last year during winter, they have a single, I still had returning to spawn in the winter. And when historical numbers, talks about thousands of fish. So these are very, very rare fish and they're threatened in, in, in all shapes and forms. So we're very lucky, but we gotta be careful. Um, this is another cool guy. These are freshwater sponges. So they're the same family of the sponges you see in the reefs and Caribbean and in the ocean. Um, but this are, can only be found in fresh water. And they usually have this bright, green color, sometimes more on the white, the yellow side, sometimes whitish. But the good thing is these are an uh, important indicator of the water quality. So if we have any sort of pollution or chemicals that should not be there in the water, these are the first kind of, this, 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 the disappearance of this guy will trigger the alarm. So, you know, when we find them in the river, it means that the water quality is still um, pretty good. This one in the picture is a small guy. They grow very slow and, you know, they're around the rock. So any gravel that runs on top can kind of damage them, but they just keep growing. This is what's small around five or six inches. 
but even though they can they can they they feed on filtering the water and even with the small size they can filter two or three olympic pools of water a day to get bigger water so these are like kind of small lung that just keeps filtering water all day long and I have no clue that uh, we could find them. I knew uh, the, about their presence in, the, in some of their in cantaloupe lakes and stuff, but I ended up finding them in, in quite a few rivers here. So a Brunette River, Stony, um, Stony Creek, uh, Lynn Creek, Capilano River, Seymour. So most of the rivers that still got uh, a good uh, uh, water quality, you, you can still find, you just, hard you gotta look for the right um the right time because <clears throat> since they're 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 always filtrating they get covered with a lot of sediment so to find them you gotta go in the wind sorry in the spring when the water levels are not super high but it's been raining a lot so you can see the green patches of the sponges and i was very surprised and i really i really like them so i'm always kind of hey guys this is really cool these are uh, Dolly Varden. It's another fish that most people are not aware. So um, Dolly Varden and the bull trout, uh, they're part of a group of fish, we call them char. For, if you're not into fishing, not a fish people, you may not uh, see what's the difference between a Dolly Varden and a trout. So Dolly Varden, um, they have this uh, yellow spots in their body and you see their, their fins. You have this bright orange with the yellow mark. And uh, when you're in the water, it's very hard to, to find the difference between Dolly Vardens and bull trout. But in this case, this was uh, taken in the Seymour River. And uh, we know uh, by uh, scientific data that there's no, there isn't a, a bull trout population there. So uh, we are confident these are Dolly Varden. And again, this fish are, they're small um when in a small stream so around 10 12 inches and they re they really need high uh, uh water quality as as all those um fish and um i could not find them in in more in more like urbanized stream so i only find them uh in a serpentine river and in uh in a seymour uh, river and in, of course in a capilano but uh even, even though they're listed for most of the streams I visit, uh, I could not find them. But um, I was very happy even to find one. They're a really cool fish. And if you fly fishermen, you know, uh, these are, uh, these are uh, they're like, these are like that trophy fish. And uh, mostly, uh, you know, they're very overlooked by, you know, uh, scientists. And so not a lot of data. When you talk about someone, it's most people don't even remember these guys, but very important. These are uh, Western Brook lampreys, which is another fish that um, we know they're there, but they're very, very hard to find. So they spend most of their time uh, in the gravel under rocks and um, logs and stuff. Different from other lampreys, these are not parasites. So they feed on like dead animals, organic matter, you know, um, any, anything that's kind of decomposing in the bottom. Uh, and you can only find them uh, during their spawning time, which is coming up. Uh, it's usually end of May, beginning of July. So all, this, all the fish from the watershed, they kind of migrate to a single stream, usually very tiny streams. Um, this, uh, this one that was photographed, it's a small tributary of a small tributary in the Seymour River. I could barely get in the water. I mean, I could barely fit my camera in the water. And they're, they're really cool because when they're spawning, they get all together in like in a big black ball full of fish. And the whole like water body gets full with this fish. So basically you walk in and you see a stream that is black and it's covering uh, Western Brook, uh, Brook Lamprey. And that kind of spawning frenzy uh, lasts one or two days. And after that, everything is gone and you don't see those fish for a an year. And yeah, uh, this picture could only be captured with the help of the, the guys from the Seymour Someone Wanted Society who gave me a call and say, hey, you got some, 
some fish here and you should come and check it out. These are very, very, uh, it's a very unique uh, situation to find them spawning. And yeah, they're, 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 they're present in most of our urban uh, streams. These are cultural trout. Um, most people don't really pay attention, but uh, here in Vancouver, we get the coastal cultural trout, which is an uh, endangered uh, fish as well. And not uh, most people don't know, uh, some of these fish, they also migrate to the ocean. So some of them spend their whole life in fresh water, even adults, but some of them migrate out to the ocean when they're juvenile. And when the adult in a much larger size than the resident, they will come back and spawn. And sometimes they breed with the, with the local fish that spend their whole life in fresh water. And that's a strategy for the fish to keep their, uh, their genes uh, strong and um, prevent, for, for example, if something happened in the ocean, the population in the river can kind of cover up the population that was missing in the ocean and vice versa. So in the river that, for example, uh, has some issue with pollution, um, having that population out in the sea is a guarantee that can that river can be repopulated in the back. So it's a really cool way that fish found to safeguard for their future. So in this project, um, I've learned a lot. Um, I'm from Brazil. Uh, we don't have uh, salmon there. So this was a, a learning uh, process for me. And I'd like to share some of what I learned. So if I want people to care, I need to take them to the place and have that they care about. So people only care for what they're aware. There's no way they can care a fish that they don't know. So I realized that um, I could tell people the fish I was seeing, I could tell them the stories, but they have to see the fish. And that was very important for me when I realized that it's, it's a picture that engaged people in conservation. That's when I said, okay, I gotta take this project further. And that's how the book came out. Um, I also learned that over 200 species of animals rely directly on salmon for sustenance. So orca, homo sapiens, sea lions, bear, wolves, otter, eagles, uh, among others. Just mind uh, when I say homo sapiens, I mean humans. And some people believe, think that salmon is just like a food uh, source. But from some populations, salmon is, is much more uh, important than just a food source. They're, uh, they're extremely connected to their life cycle, to their culture, and all their activities are, re are related to salmon. So it's not just a food sample. It's, it, it's something much that's, that goes much deeper. And over 200 species rely. So even though they may not feed right on the salmon, they may uh, they rely on something that's related to salmon returning. So salmon is a key species for the whole ecosystem. If you take salmon out, um, it's just a chain that starts just crashing down. And, and nowadays, for example, there's uh, studies that they can trace um, signs of salmon, even in, uh, in, in, in the trees and forests, like in, in old growth forests. So that, you know, bears drag those salmon up to their land by the trees and that kind of fertilize the tree. So it's a, it's a massive uh, food web and salmon is, is the key species in the whole ecosystem. And uh, just this fish in the picture, these are not salmon, these are mountain white fish. And these are one of my favorite fish, and these are really cool. This was taken in the Upper Chilliwack River in the Fraser Valley, and when you when you, you can go your whole can go all year round in the Chilliwack Lake, and it's very rare to find this fish. Like sometimes you see one here or another, but it's very rare to find dense schools. But when it's getting close to the summer returning time. Those fish start schooling in massive schools by the, this river mouth in the lake. And it seems like there's no salmon around, but the fish are there because they know they can come anytime and they're, they're just waiting for the eggs. So again, the whole ecosystem works towards salmon and, and seems they have like a timer. And uh, you know, when it's getting close, 
everyone's starting getting ready and uh, it's, it's, it's the whole, the salmon returning is a very important for the whole ecosystem. Um, I also learned there's no salmon without riparian vegetation and riparian vegetation is basically forest. So there's no way to have a healthy salmon stream if you don't have a healthy uh, vegetation around and the vegetation helps salmon in many ways. So at first sight, uh, it works as a shelter. So old logs, old trees, um, small fish can shelter when they're getting ready to migrate to the ocean. Also shelter for adult fish when they're coming to, they're getting the river to spawn. But also the riparian vegetation is extremely important because that's where insects grow. And those are very much the insects that will feed the future generation. So the salmon cycle, we know the adults come in the river, they lay their eggs and they die. And those carcasses will feed the, in, those insects. But where those insects are coming, coming from, right? So the, the, in the, basically the vegetation and the forest will kind of work as a seed. So it creates the environment, the food is in the water. So all those, you can create that um, environment that's, <clears throat> that's good for the insects to eat and develop. So when the eggs hatch, there will be uh, food available for, uh, for the small fish. And also the lack of vegetation changes the water parameters. So pH, temperature, um, if you don't have a healthy vegetation, when the big rain comes, you see all the rivers getting all marked and that really affects the, the, the environment for salmon as well. Um, I've learned um, working in more pristine uh, places, you can have the biggest rain you can ever imagine. You go in the Salmon River that has a healthy vegetation and the salmon, the, the river is never murky or it's murky for a couple of hours. So that whole vegetation helps to keep the soil there, to keep the kind of more a stable environment. So it's, uh, it's, uh, the vegetation is as important as the fish. And that's something I, I have no clue. And uh, just an add, um, when, when I mean the, having pristine vegetation, it's, uh, it's very pristine. So uh, we having some discussion about uh, logging old growth forests. And uh, now it's known to science that some insects and some food chains can only exist uh, in old growth forests. And that's very important for, for a healthy salmon uh, ecosystem as well. And I learned that a river can be restored. So this is the Brunel River in DC. Uh, we're gonna talk about that uh, in the documentary, what happened in the river and what's the situation right now and why it is so important. But for me, learning that it's possible to restore a river, there was a game changer in my whole project. So let me uh, quickly in talk about myself and why that's so important. So I was born in a city called Piracicaba in Brazil. Uh, is the small red dot here in the southeast of Brazil. And I grew up listening to the stories about this amazing fish in the river. Uh, very much like uh, Vancouverites. So probably if you get anyone that's already around their 60, 70 or 8 years old, they probably will have stories of uh, amazing uh, numbers of fish um, in our watershed. We have um, records of people saying they could almost walk on the backs of fish uh, in the Brunel River or that fish could, you could catch fish with your bare hands in, uh, in Lynn Creek or Capilano as the most, as the best uh, fly fishing river for salmon in the world. So I grew up listening to those stories and I always wanna go and catch a fish like that. But when it was my time to go fish, um, this is what I found. So all those massive catfish, all those big fish were, were gone in my hometown, in my home river. And when I got here and I learned that a river can be restored, I said, well, so 
that you know we can we can do that back home too and that was very important uh river restoration and environment restoration by now is the way to go to guarantee that future generation will have access to salmon to salmon so that, uh, that kind of totally blew my mind and i also learned with this project that is not just in brazil that the waterways are threatened so uh, this was not take in in a, in a metro Vancouver. This is a small uh, side channel in the lower Fraser. So not in metro Vancouver, but quite close. And this is obviously the tire. And tires are the most common um, thing I've seen in rivers. I would say 100% of the water bodies I visit, 100% of them have tires in it. Um, more or less, bigger or small, but all of them have tires. And there was an important research that was published a couple of weeks ago uh, relating um, the uh, salmon mortality for uh, juveniles related to components that are associated with tires. So if that's true, that tires could be killing juvenile co. Uh, that's an issue that we have to address and you have to address very, very uh, fast. Uh, this is one of the most important, important uh, spawning grounds for Chinook salmon in the lower Fraser. This is the, in the heart of Fraser uh, in between Hope and, uh, and Chilliwack. And you just, just see the beautiful blue water and I have, I have no, no clue how many tires I found it right here, basically everywhere. So. We start, we have, when you, if you want to have salmon for future generations, you have to start addressing this issue right now. And that's what, you know, that's what we want to have. And that's what we can have with have tires. Um, this is another very important issue. So gravel is especially important for salmon. They need specific kind of gravel in a, in a size and shape and in a variety that allows them to lay their eggs and get their eggs uh, covered and protected. So again, this was not taken uh, in a Metro Vancouver, but this shows um, an issue that affected salmon everywhere. So some of municipalities are starting laying uh, signs by the salmon uh, streams asking for people, especially when someone is around and spawning time to refrain getting water and especially dogs. So when legs are, the salmon eggs are very, very fragile. And even though they, they, they get covered and they go quite deep in, 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 uh, in the gravel, in the beginning, when they're just being laid, uh, if you walk in a river and you stack on the eggs, you're gonna, you're gonna kill them. So this, this picture, uh, again, was in the heart of the Fraser in Herling Island. And this is, uh, the fish were right spawning and you can see this mark. So people were using this to access the island. So they were basically driving on top of the salmon uh, reds or uh, the, uh, the nests as we call it. And I could see that happening in most of the streams. So um, most people don't know, they see someone, they, you know, they want to get close to the fish. They, you know, they're, they want to, their, their dogs to have some fun in the water, but uh, that's a big no, no. We have to refrain and stay out of the water, especially in during spawning time. So this is a picture of the salmon egg that gives an example. Imagine if you walk on top of this, it's just going to squish all these eggs. And this is a more uh, detailed uh, image of the egg. So this is the this is a coho uh, salmon egg. It's around 15 days, and you can see the embryo here just starting to develop. You can see the beginning of the spinal cord, um, the eyes, and these small bubbles you see here. These are lipids. So basically, this the the small fish will feed on those lipids until it's strong enough to hatch the egg. And once they hatch the egg there, but you know, they have to start, they have to, to look for uh, food for themselves. And something I learned uh, taking this picture, it was, I have no clue is uh, when you look at the egg, it looks 
uh, I, I thought that the embryo was inside the egg and it, it doesn't move much, but that's uh, totally wrong. So when I was uh, trying to get this picture and, uh, and the footage, every time I would turn my lights on, the small fish would just go and go under the egg. So the embryo inside the egg is totally mobile. We can move in, in every direction. And I could see it kind of looking at me. So that was really cool. You can you just start imagine that potentially the fish inside the egg can see the world around him. So that was that was very cool and a big challenge to, to photograph them. So uh, as I said, uh, capture the heart and uh, mind will follow. So again, what I want with this project is just show the beauty and the amazing thing of having the fish in our backyard. And um, these are not, these are not gonna stay, if you don't care and you know, if you don't start working towards uh, environment restoration, this fish are not gonna stay for long. And my goal was trying that this fish don't end up like my hometown when fish are all gone. So in 60 years ago, people would travel for all over Brazil to go fish right in my city, very much like we do here in the Vancouver Island and the Skinner River, North BC. And after 60 years that my river, my home river is totally dead. So <clears throat> what I really uh, wanted uh, is avoid that our, our salmon end up the same fate that my hometown river. So um, thanks so much for watching. Now um, we're gonna share the link uh, with, the, with the Urban Salmon documentary. And then I would like to invite uh, everyone to stay on the, in the Zoom call and come back for, the, for a Q&A session uh, after the film. Yeah, uh, I see there are a couple of questions. I think though they come during the, the presentation. Uh, maybe we could start uh, with those. For sure, um, yeah. Um, I've yeah. got the first one that was asked um, was from uh, Donna. Uh, it says, uh, how is there a way for you to tell the difference between wild salmon and uh, hatchery salmon? Is there a noticeable difference and can you tell? Yeah, so um, some of the hatcheries, they clip the adipose fin, which is that small uh, fin that someone have uh, close to their tails. So uh, in, in Canada, not all hatcheries do that. Uh, some do. So that would be the only way for you to identify a hatchery fish. like. If you're not a, if you if you don't have access to a lab or or anything, that would be the only way to identify if it's a hatchery fish or not. Uh, and that uh, that the fin clipping was done so fishermen, when they catch a fish, they they could know could know if uh, if there was a hatchery or a wild fish, and if it's a hatchery, they could retain. If it's a wild, they likely have to release it. Uh, but yeah, uh, fortunately, there's no way you know um, all like the salmon, if they, if they don't have their fin clip, it is very hard to identify if it's a hatchery or not. Great, uh, we had another uh, question following that, um, talking about uh, pine head. Um, mm -hmm. So are only hatchery bred fish going to and swimming around uh, tine head? Are there no uh, wild salmon there that we know of? Can you speak to that? Yeah, so I, uh, I don't have the returning numbers from uh, Tyne Head uh, from this year, last year. Uh, I, what I can say is from my experience, uh, I've been uh, photographing there around four times in the last five years. And I would say uh, most of the fish I've seen were not, did not have their fins clipped. So I, could assume that most of their fish, of their returning fish, are actually wild fish. Uh, deserves a mention that they have uh, some Chinook returning. Uh, Chinook were non-native uh, from that watershed, but uh, since uh, years uh, in, in since the past, uh, there was um, there were released Chinook there. So nowadays we have a we have a small Chinook population. Uh, 
and probably most uh, hatchery. But I would say from my experience that most of the fish I've seen uh, in a close to time had hatchery were, uh, were wild fish. Great. Um, Mike Forrest asks, uh, can you speak to the pinniped seal population um, and their increased predation threat to salmon um, with this revival that we've been experiencing? Yeah, that's a very controversial topic. Um, I can speak uh, from my experience as a biologist and spending time with salmon. Um, the biggest issue right now uh, with salmon is uh, basically when the juvenile migrate out to the ocean, they are not coming back. So all the signs uh, point to that the fact that the issue of uh, mortality is not happening in fresh water, it's happening in the ocean. Um, we have, uh, well, First Nation used to, to predate on pinnips for, for, for um, since millennia. So uh, their historical data that says there was less pinnips uh, in our estuaries and, and close to our shores. But uh, my personal experience, uh, again, I'm not a salmon biologist. Uh, definitely, there is uh, there uh, salmon is being predated by the seals, but I would not support uh, killing pinnipeds uh, for the benefit of salmon. Um, unfortunately, we never had in the whole world a situation when we killed a species to make uh, easier for another species to thrive. I believe if we're having a disbalancing in some species, uh, the biggest, the issue to be addressed is much bigger than just going there and, and get rid of the seal. And a good example could be, um, okay, uh, seals are predating salmon, let's get rid of the seals. And then we find out the seals were especially important from a small fish that feed that thing. And then you actually get to the whole, the complexity of the environment with the salmon environment is much bigger than just say, okay, let's cool this, let's uh, have less seals predating. And also um, when the small fish are migrating, are migrating out to the ocean, they're very small. So for example, juvenile, the most predation actually is uh, from birds and not from uh, pinnips when they're small. So the predation would be actually when they're coming back as adults. So I would say that's a controversial topic. For sh it seems there's disbalance in the number of the of pinnips uh, in our coast, but uh, I I would I I don't agree that uh, killing them or bringing their numbers slower would make uh, salmon life easier. Thank you for that. I actually had a question. Um, so. This is related more to uh, the impact of global warming on salmon decline. So you've been working in some way, shape or form on uh, Pacific salmon for years now with the combination of both this documentary project and the, and the book, as well as your other works. Um, what, from your time working uh, and taking photos and, and research, what's your perspective on the impact of global warming and uh, Pacific salmon I think, uh, of course, uh, global warming, uh, it affects uh, salmon in all sorts of uh, ways. So uh, if we have a warmer climate, we're going to change the, the temperature of the water in the ocean and in fresh water. If you change the temperature of the water in the ocean, um, that would definitely affect salmon. If you're changing fresh water, you see less eggs hatching. When adults are returning and the water uh, is too warm, they get uh, infection disease in their eyes. So uh, 2018, that we have a very warm temperatures right at the salmon peak season. So you'd see a lot of uh, chrome fish straight out of the ocean, but they are blind. So they have infection in their eyes. So uh, definitely uh, global warming is probably the, the biggest threat for salmon right now. But um, the issue, I, in my opinion, it has you have to be addressed in a more like a global way, in a sense, for example, this, 
if we could address uh, global war in the ocean, but we don't have uh, vibrant and healthy riparian vegetation, would not make any difference. If we address the vegetation, but we don't address the issue in the ocean, we would be still be in the same problem. So I believe that uh, if we want to have healthy population for salmon, we have to address all the issues, start addressing the issues in a, in a global way. So restoring the vegetation, restoring the river, um, seeing um, what we can do to mitigate climate change, um, slow down the process for sure. We have to address commercial fishing, we have to address fish farms, we have to address the imbalance that the existence of those created. Um, so um, salmon issue is a global is, is a global thing and it is I don't think that pinpoint one factor and say let's work this and see what happened is the way. But um, there's, uh, especially recent, there's a lot of literature available. We're very lucky in BC. We have amazing nonprofits. We have uh, really good media producing high quality uh, information, accurate information. So, um, you know, it's, uh, it's very easy to find reliable information that can uh, help us. Great, thanks for that, uh, Fernando. Uh, I had a, another question um, on a slightly more lighthearted note. As I say, you've been working with Pacific Salmon for a very long time and you have worked in many different streams and rivers. Um, when, in your experience, was your, your favorite spot um, to take photos, to capture footage, uh, and what, what made it your favorite spot when you were there? Oof. <laughs> my, okay, my favorite spot for sure in Metro Vancouver is uh, Ling Creek. Uh, just because it's five minutes from my place and uh, I can go there and, and, and find someone all year round, juveniles or adults. Uh, during spawning time, I can find uh, most of species, uh, but sockeye, uh, even a couple Chinook, they're native from the watershed, but again, you can still find a couple. And plus steelhead, so, and it's just a beautiful place, blue, uh, transparent water. But uh, in terms of abundance, uh, I would say northwest coast of Vancouver Island, uh, even though there's a heavy log in there, having log on old growth forest, it's still the returning number are just like mind blowing. And it's, it, it's very cool to, to be in the water and being surrounded by fish. When I mean surrounded by fish, you have fish on top of you, under you, on your side, in front of your back, and seems that they don't even care you were there. Um, you, especially for Chinook, um, first they're the biggest salmon fish. So when you see a, a, a school of a spawning Chinook, it's just beautiful, they're just huge. And they, when they're kind of getting ready to, mig to migrate to the upper uh, headwaters of the river, so kind of just when they're at like the estuary, you see them swimming in circles. Uh, so imagine like five, 7,000 fish weighing like 20, 30 kilos, just swimming in circles in a blue pool. So yeah, I would say Northwest Coast Vancouver Island so far is my favorite. Fantastic, thanks for that. Um, we had a, a couple other questions that are speaking to the threats facing Pacific salmon, such as invasive species, um, freshwater bass, for instance. Uh, mm -hmm. Mike asked, I wanted to ask if you could speak to um, the danger of invasive species from your perspective? How has it impacted Pacific salmon populations? And is it something that we can say is under control or in the process of becoming under control or is it still very much a, an issue? Yeah, uh, invasive species are, are, are a big, big threat for salmon, especially in our urban waters where you can find so many invasive uh, species. So uh, as you said, uh, large mud bass, uh, small mud bass, uh, they, they predate heavily on a juvenile and, and even like, uh, doesn't need to be like, a, they, they, they feed on, they predate on the fry, they predate on the juvenile, they predate like almost all the phases. So I'm, I'm, I'm confident that like a, a black bass can have no problem in having like a eating a year old coho or two year old coho and migrating out to the ocean. And unfortunately, 
the prevalence of invasive species in urban water is just mind blowing. So I remember swimming in the Brunnen River, which is um, the, the salmon artery and having uh, pumpkin seed, uh, large month, uh, uh, black, two kinds of black bass, pumpkin seed, crepe, uh, bullhead, which is a, it's a catfish, all those invasive and they all predate heavily on, on juvenile. Not to mention, um, we, we start talking about uh, having um, Northern Pike in a, pit, uh, in a pit lake and pit river. And those are, they like, the damage they can make to a, to a salmon population is just like, it's hard to, to, to imagine. So yeah, that, that's a, a, a issue, but again, um, it's much easier for invasive species to thrive in an environment that's been disturbed. Uh, you, when you get an environment that's too pristine on in, in good quality, you're gonna you tend to find less or almost no invasive species. So, again, uh, that's a big issue. And some people said, okay, I'm just go there and try to fish and catch all the black bass and kill all of them. That would not really address the issue. The best, the best way would be start restoring the, the environment, restoring the vegetation, restoring the water quality, and then, uh, then you can start addressing the, the invasive species. Right now, uh, I'm working uh, with a Watershed Watch Salmon Society and uh, some other nonprofits in a project called Resilient Waters. And we were working in, in uh, side channels and sloughs of the Fraser River. And last week we were sampling and two days sampling and we could find no native species in, in, in a place that was like, it should be full of juvenile salmon. So invasive species are a big threat, especially in the urban uh, watershed. Great, uh, thank you for that. Um, yeah. So it's currently 8.25, um, so we've only got a, a few minutes left um, before our end time. Um, so I just wanted to take this opportunity to give uh, Fernando a great big thank you for joining us today. Um, uh, and uh, we as the Discovery Center are pleased to be, uh, to be able to offer public programs during the ongoing uncertainty surrounding COVID-19. Um, and it means a lot of us, a lot to us, that uh, you, the audience, are able to come out and support us uh, in uh, running um, online public programs such as this. It means a lot. And so thank you very much for joining us this evening. Um, Fernando's latest book, Urban Salmon, uh, is currently available uh, for purchase um, at our discovery shop at the Discovery Center, uh, which is currently open Wednesday through Saturday, uh, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, you can also buy it directly from Fernando's website, um, as well as Amazon. And if you own a Prime account, you can get it without those pesky delivery fees. Um, so in the chat right now, I will share links to both his online store as well as the Amazon store page. Um, and uh, please support him. Uh, he does uh, fantastic work, as you can see from this. And uh, we're always happy to uh, give him additional support um, in his work uh, in the Fraser River. So I'll go ahead and share those now. Yeah, um, I'm just uh, in, uh, here uh, in the chat, there are a couple of questions. So um, just uh, there's um, Donna, um, let me see. Uh, you're talking about the commercial fishing uh, of uh, salmon. And uh, if you consider the number of fish that's been caught historically and if you say, okay, we harvested this X amount of fish and compare it to historical numbers, there will be almost nothing. Um, there's estimate that back in times, First Nation will harvest more fish that is actually commercial harvest right now. Mm -hmm. But we have to remember that we're talking in 1% of the population. So yes, commercial uh, fishing is a big threat for hashing, for, uh, for salmon, and especially bycatch in the sense that uh, there's no commercial fishing for steelhead, even though they're not crashing because they just uh, end up in the nets for fish, the, for salmon. So commercial fishing is definitely a, a big issue uh, right now for, um, for salmon. 
And also, uh, Mike, uh, Mike Forrest mentioning uh, here uh, that we have returning uh, 25 million sockeye in 2014. Uh, historical numbers talk about 100 uh, million. So even if we, if, if we look specifically for each population and even in each river, you may find that some populations are actually growing and some population are actually still have their historical numbers. But if you look as an overall, that the trend is going, uh, it's just crashing. And from, I'll give an example, 2014, uh, it, it talking, uh, said about 20 million uh, sockeye, but in the Adams River in 2018, we had 700,000. Uh, fish from an estimate, like their numbers, they were expecting 14 million fish and we ended with 700,000 fish. So uh, there's no questions that the numbers are going down. And even if you consider the returning numbers in Alaska, which is uh, they're just skyrocketing, there's, uh, there's consideration that maybe some of our fish are actually uh, looking for colder water and the fish are actually moving north. So uh, there, I, I think the, it's a concern about all the scientists that uh, some are returning, uh, some of the numbers are just crashing. And yeah, I think... Uh, right, well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you very much for joining us this evening uh, for our Faces of the Fraser. Thank you to Fernando for your presentation and for the documentary. Um, and uh, yes, as it just said in the chat, uh, the book is uh, available at our, dis at our gift store at the Discovery Shop. So uh, if you're ever in uh, New West, stop on by and pick it up. And uh, yeah, thank you for your insight, Fernando, echoing uh, Mike there. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you. And guys, I just posted, uh, there's a website of the project, urbansalmon.com. Uh, feel free to visit. I'm always updating there from, from where you can find my, uh, our social medias, what I'm posting all the time. So if you ever interested in seeing someone or learning more about, make sure to visit the website and, uh, and our social media as well. Fantastic. Great. Thank you very much, everyone. We're going to end the meeting here. Um, so thank you for all joining us and have a very, very nice evening. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Bye.